The organizers, first of all, and then uh, I should say that I, um, my name is Soren, and I'm sharing the podium with uh, my colleague um, Michael Nice from the University of Uppsala. And unfortunately, I'm not sharing the podium with our third co-author, Sarah Kraft from uh, Aarhus University, but she is uh, very much part of the study that we're going to present. The paper that, uh, that we'll be presenting is, in fact, a direct response to the call for uh, today's session to uh, examine the particularly late or early phases of some of the uh, classical urban sites that have been significant in our understanding of various phases of urbanization in uh, Europe. And so what we are going to do is to uh, present a uh, revisit to a particularly early workshop in the Emporium of Riebe in Denmark, uh, a site that has produced uh, workshops of the 9th century of the Viking Age that produced uh, women's ornaments in particular and has been quite uh, pivotal in, in, in uh, giving us our picture of crafts in Viking town. But we'll present an earlier workshop that to some extent gives a different picture. However, we will also use this example to try and argue a point uh, that we believe have been, has been um, overlooked in uh, the study of crafts and the, the, um, the discussions as to what is the significance of crafts work in relation to uh, urbanization. When we talk about crafts and urbanization, we're dealing with a very well established, we're a very old uh, relationship. If we go back to, to um, uh, Gordon Child's uh, definition of uh, urbanism in his paper on the urban revolution, specialized craftsmen are uh, some of the, mo the key actors uh, in the transition to an urban economy. And uh, you can even uh, sense I think that a uh, child sees the, the, the craft person as one of the actors that not only comes uh, into his own with urbanization, but to some extent urbanization is an answer to the predicament of craft people. Despite this, um, crafts have had a strangely uh, withdrawn role in the uh, discussion of the early medieval emporia. Uh, through much of the pe uh, period of the 20th century. And the reason was that was partly because of the way that emporia were conceived of literally before they were excavated. We knew about these uh, uh, sites, maritime sites, from written sources uh, and uh, some of the early conceptions of sites uh, like Hedeby or Beke that were uh, excavated uh, in the late 19th and the early 20th century was that they were transit points for long distance trade. And um, combined with the fact that there was at that time a rather weak archeological evidence for the settlement uh, areas of those sites as, um, as opposed to the, uh, the burial sites. That meant that, that uh, researchers could uh, legitimately assume that crafts was well, craft was something that occurred. It was expected to occur because in a site with much trade, which was seen to be the defining aspect of these sites, of course, there would be individuals taking the opportunity to market uh, items they had produced. But was, this was not seen as something that was central to the economy of those sites. However, uh, in the late 1970s, following large-scale excavations, in particular in Riebel and in Hedeby, New uh, ex, uh, examinations showed that there was in fact a massive evidence for craft production of various sorts, iron working, bone and antler working, uh, uh, copper alloy, metal working, glass working in some of these sites. And uh, a number of important studies followed. However, at that time, uh, the, the standard paradigm for interpreting these sites were that they were very much sites uh, connected with elite power and expressing uh, an organization, a top-down organization. And 
partly for that reason, partly be, I think because people adhere to the old pattern of seeing the craft people as something incidental. <laughs> Uh, the dominant interpretations were that the craft people were either in the practicing in these places because they were told to do so by their lords, or because they were itinerants uh, that traveled around from various markets and would happen in this place then in another place. It's only recently, quite recently, that people have turned to see the craft people as uh, genuine urban actors in these sites. This has come after. The, uh, some uh, renewed excavations in the 1990s in Birka, in Bebe, in uh, Hedeby, and in Kaupang that have changed, I think, our perception of uh, the uh, Scandinavian uh, emporia uh, to the effect that these are now seen as more permanent places with a permanent population that included highly specialized craft people. However, the paradigm for analyzing uh, that and what has been sort of the main uh, line in uh, the interpretation of crafts uh, has been to see these people as individual practitioners that practiced uh, uh, a craft that delivered ready uh, products to consumers. And that has gone fine uh, if you were thinking about something like hair combs or brooches that could be per, uh, uh, purchased and used readily on the clothes that you were wearing uh, before, which were exactly the kind of things that have been seen in the, uh, in the 9th century layers. However, um, we have been wondering in this, question, uh, in this uh, model what happened to the practical logic of crafts? We've seen craftsmen in relation to their raw materials, we've seen them in relation to their customers, but what, at, how about the actual activities that craftsmen pursued? Many of the, pro uh, the products that craftspeople in the early Middle Ages would produce were not a product of one craftsperson, but the result of several specialized workers interacting. If you think even about uh, a simple piece of dress that would um, uh, uh, combine uh, the efforts of uh, obviously um, uh, textile workers, but also uh, blacksmiths and um, leather workers and uh, fine metal smiths. Uh, a, gar a piece of garment would not be complete without the interaction of these. The blacksmith in particular is crucial because the blacksmith would produce the tools for every other craftsman. If you look at something even more complicated, like a piece of horse harness or a saddle, that uh, also includes specialized part products from a number of craftspeople. You can't go to a, uh, a blacksmith or a, a, a copper alloy metal worker and get a complete set of what you need for a saddle and horse harness. You need several uh, highly specialized uh, craftsmen to interact. So, uh, the question that this puts us with is, would this interaction of the crafts be potentially a bottom-up incentive to urbanize? Could it be that some of what we see as urban about the urban emporia, these places where particular advanced crafts are united in one place instead of being just dispersed in various places, could that be in part due to the craftsmen's need to collaborate with a number of specialists across the craft. So we went to uh, one previously excavated site that Sarakwa has recently done a re examination of. And uh, in that site we have in, uh, investigated the uh, finds from uh, an early 8th or mid early mid 8th century uh, workshop. What has been curious about this site, as we started, was that while there were a lot of uh, unidentified moulds, in particular of bronze, uh, or copper alloy casting, many of these could not be readily identified with known objects. Um, and uh, when they could, we didn't always know those objects from finds. So something was very different from the later uh, phases. We couldn't quite identify what was the scale of production. Were we dealing with finds that were a little, a small subsection of a long and, and uh, uh, large scale production, or were we dealing with a lucky find from a very short uh, uh, focused production? 
what was the duration and what was the sophistication and nature of the workshop. This was uh, our starting point and uh, at this point uh, Michael should take over because yes. what we uh, chose to do was to use 3D modeling. Exactly, Sachi. exactly. So uh, the very workshop uh, operated in six noun phases. Please stay here and um, protect me. Uh, during phase two and three the workshop uh, produced keys, belt buckles, straps, ends and the so-called uh, Odin objects Here's another picture, and uh, the intended function of uh, these um, is not really determined yet, had been not. Uh, some fragments have been reassembled during post-excavation, um, but the large majority has remained as individual uh, finds. And we initiated our project in order to see whether modern 3D-based um, analysis could make a difference. I retrieved our scans with a portable laser scanner by Next Engine, and the research task demanded some basic knowledge about Viking Age casting techniques. Uh, clay molds uh, are one-time products, as we know, and uh, as the material is broken down during firing, and after the fragments uh, have been, uh, or the Molds have been fired, they're really fragile and need to uh, be deposited quickly, otherwise they will just erode. Uh, it seems likely that the Odin mold, in uh, lack of a better term, uh, that they were plentified by the imprint method. Here the Feinsmith just presses a master model into clay, into a lump of clay, and the imprint uh, method usually results in uh, varying thicknesses in these different uh, pieces of clay. Uh, and hence, every mold will have a unique partition profile which helps us to reassemble individual and uh, unknown fragments. Uh, I used MeshLab in order to clean the laser made models and in order to analyze the imprints. And 3D models are far handier to analyze than towered light photographs that we had to work with in the beginning. And MeshLab is a 3D software that allows us to illuminate, of course, uh, any model from any given direction. And thus we can detect unknown shapes, we can associate solitary fragments, we can also revise um, unmotivated association done by earlier research generations. And uh, it makes, makes it also possible to actually split up and to reassemble uh, mold fragments that, that have been glued for good in real life. Previously we uh, knew of 16 mold fragments that come from designated Odin objects and thanks to 3D laser scanning five new have been uh, ident identified. So as a result the number of surviving molds we could reconstruct has risen to seven or eight, a little bit depending on. And besides that, we were also able to reassemble a key that I should have shown you before. Here's the key. And a remarkable result of these, of our 3D-based endeavors uh, was our newly acquired ability to associate fragments from different contexts and different uh, phases. And this has some important implications for our understanding and um, for the time frame in which this very uh, uh, workshop operated. In fact, it seems very likely that we are dealing with a single specialized workshop that produced a wide range of objects and our finding had already been somewhat anticipated, I must admit, but in fact the deposition pattern, as you can see it, um, yeah, it verifies it for sure, I think. Um, and it seems to be actually that all these fragments were discarded during one episode. And uh, this conclusion in turn is a bit uh, provoking as um, traditional knowledge about this site would be that uh, everything happened in a time span of 40 years. And so we're suddenly down to one event. Um, so to summarize, the whole thing, uh, 3D laser scanning uh, and analysis helped us to identify new artifacts, to make new mold associations, to establish that the production was rather small scale and uh, short lived, and yes, maybe, just maybe also, 
um, it helped us to understand uh, what these uh, objects actually were used for. So having, and I say painstakingly, puzzled together an entire virtual model by recycling different parts from different mode fragments, I was able to simulate a virtual cast, as you can see, and this actually gave us a surprise because this little thing is quite thick and it would withstand actually um, uh, yes, a certain amount of force and putting all pieces together of this uh, Odin puzzle uh, we felt a little bit on the right side and wanted to contribute with a new hypothesis <laughs> what this actually could be and uh, our suggested rec reconstruction builds on the fact that we uh, also found uh, two nice buckles and a beautiful strap uh, end at the same side. Um, so take it as it is. A bridle naturally demands handicraft, uh, expertise that is usually not provided by a solitary fine smith, as we all know, and this brings us back to the beginning of Seren's paper. Thus, uh, the workshop at Nikolai Gay might be an example of a joint venture that consisted of individual handicraft experts and these specialists were in need of each other's skill and Riebe turned out to be the very spot where you could meet each other and just yet yeah, get going and make things happen. It comes with human nature that we not always succeed with collaborations but uh, it seems to us that Riebe happened to be the place that produced sufficient with, with successful collaborations that attracted ever more collaborations and so on and so forth and so we be developed into that very note that put yes handicraft on the viking age map do you have anything to add thank you very much thank you <laughs>